Hello, hello, and welcome back to our Chemical Serenity, the pagan podcast that takes you on a journey through the woods, across the fields and moors, down to the beach where we can sit around the campfire and talk all things spiritual in a witchy, druidy and pagan way. If you're new to my channel, then welcome. My name's Carolyn and thank you for listening in and I hope you will find some helpful information. If you're already subscribed or you pop back in now and again, thank you for sticking with me. It's great to have you here and seeing as how many of you are tuning in, please feel free to click on the subscribe button because it's free. So why not? OK, let's get into today's podcast on looking deeper into the wheel of the year. My first podcast on here in 2023 went into the Wheel of the Year and then it went on to talk about the first point, um, first festival of Imolk. And then, of course, how the seasons were broken up and the gods and the goddesses that were attributed to each one. Now, however, I've always felt that the wheel needed a bit more explanation. So if you've seen the wheel in all its various designs by many artists over the years, um, and I've added one onto the YouTube podcast so that you can see it and how it looks um, as I'm talking, then you know that at the top we have Yule in the Northern Hemisphere. But in the Southern Hemisphere, you probably have it the other way around so that you're celebrating the summer solstice in December. For the purpose of this podcast, I'm going to work with the Northern Hemisphere as this is obviously where it was conceived and this is where I am. But you can adjust it to suit which of the two hemispheres you are from. The wheel itself is made up of eight seasonal festivals, with roughly six weeks between each one. Now, Gerald Gardner, who created the religion of Wicca, didn't observe the solstices, and his high priestess, Margaret Murray, wrote in 1921 that witches' sabbats were originally held on eve nights of May, November, February and August. Now, Gardner's closest friend, Ross Nichols, who went on to found the Order of the Bard Overts and Druids, wanted to celebrate the solstices, so... On one of their many retreats that they had together, Gardner chose the Sabbaths for the Wiccans and Nichols the Solstices for the Druids. Move forward 20 years and we come to the first development of the wheel as we know it today. Aidan Kelly was another neo-pagan who was a prolific writer. He was raised a Roman Catholic in the United States and at university he was asked to write a witch's ritual for a friend as part of her graduate art seminar and whether any power or energy could be raised from the said ritual. Now, this wasn't a problem for Kelly, as his own research into alternative religions had given him plenty of resources to use. These included books such as The White Goddess by Robert Graves, The Golden Bough by Sir James Fraser, and early rituals of Gerald Gardner's. With all this in hand, he wrote a ritual to invoke the goddess. Despite a few trials, the energy wasn't happening, and it fell flat on its face until they decided to try it on the 1st of August at Lunasa or Lamas, when in Kelly's words, the energy they raised was almost psychedelic. The group continued to meet and carry out monthly full moon rituals, which eventually evolved into a type of Gardnerian witchcraft. In 1974, Kelly was asked by the editor of the Green Egg magazine to create a wheel to show the festival dates. Now, the Green Egg magazine was um, and still is a neo pagan publication, and it started in 1968 by the Church of All Worlds. And although still in publication today, it has many has had many stops and starts. Now, because the three equinoxes and solstices didn't have an attributed name, Kelly looked for ideas for them through English history, and he came up with Astara after the Anglo Saxon goddess of spring. Litha, which is an old English word for calm and gentle. But autumn equinox just became a bit of a challenge as there was very little that could be attributed to this festival until he came across a Welsh mythology story about the Mabon, who was the son of the Modron. Now, I have to admit, I find it incredibly hard, as do many of my colleagues in this industry, as to why we use the Mabon at all, because it's got nothing to do with us this time of the year. And I always feel that um, it was used in desperation or rather last minute. I wonder if we could attribute something new. Anyway, Kelly named the calendar and uh, submitted it for publication. Now, bearing in mind that the three names above found by Aidan Kelly are not used by the British Druids. So there are, in theory, two years of the year. There is the Wiccan and Witchcraft, and then there is the Druid. Now, because the publication, uh, the wheel became the go-to place for uh, most people on 
a witchcraft path. And today we see many interpretations and different styles um, and different attributes um, as people have become very artistic and added extra bits and pieces into it. But it still kept close to the original idea of Kelly's and it is a very useful tool to walk us through the year. The quarter festivals, solstices, equinoxes or lesser sabbats break the circle up into quarters. And if you're looking at either, if you've got a picture of the Wheel of the Year of your own or if you're on YouTube and you're looking at the one that I've put in place now, you will see how the circle, firstly, is broken into quarters. So you've got Yule, um, which is the winter solstice, which is known as Albanartan, which means light of winter or art, as in the great bear in the sky at this time of the year, to the Druids. Then Ostara, spring equinox, Albanalir, which means light of earth, as in the sun returning, to the Druids. Litha, summer solstice, Albanevan, which is light of summer or light of the shore. And then Mabon, autumn equinox, Albanelfed, meaning light of the water. So that's your quarters. And then we have the cross quarter festivals, which means they split the quarters in two. Now, these are fire festivals or greater sabbats to witchcraft and are called by the same names for both crafts. So both um, Wiccan witchcrafts um, followers and Druids will call them Imolk, Beltane, Lunasa or Lamas and Samhain. The quarter festivals mark the change in the season or the beginning and end of a season, whereas the cross quarters mark the height of the season. So, for example, Yule, Albanartan, is the end of the autumn and the beginning of winter, with Imolk marking the very height of winter as we know it now. It's not midwinter because midwinter historically would have been Yule, which I'll come to that in a moment. Then we look at Ostara, Albanalir, which is the end of winter and the beginning of spring, with Beltane marking the height of spring. Litha, Albanefen, in is the end of spring. And then you've got the beginning of summer, with Lunasa or Lamas marking the height of the summer season. Mabon, Albanelfed, is the end of the summer, beginning of autumn, with Samhain being the height of the autumn season. Our Celtic ancestors wouldn't have celebrated anything as elaborate as we do now. They knew only two seasons, winter and summer, or the dark half of the year and the light half of the year. So Yule was midwinter and Litha as midsummer. Hence the traditional song in the bleak midwinter that was sung as a Christmas carol. The cross quarter days are celebrated on fixed dates, usually the first day of the month. So starting from sundown the day before, as Margaret Murray said, they start the day before. Um, so, for example, Beltane will start on sundown on April the 30th and end on sundown on May the 1st. But then along came the Internet and people felt the need to make changes to the ancient traditions to suit themselves, their coven or group meetings or even a book being published. I've seen some of the most bizarre things said about these traditionals. Um, festivals. So let's, as I always say, let's not over egg the pudding, as this is going to just, you know, confuse more people, especially if you're starting out on this path or you've got an interest of where everything originated from. So why complicate these things? Keep it simple, like our ancestors did when you're first starting out and stick to a date that suits you, your energies and what you have time to commit to. No one's right and no one is wrong. What is right is is the way you do this on your journey. So if you do see different days, find one that works for you. The quarter days are celebrated at the solstices and the equinoxes, which are astro astronomical events, have a slight variation to the year. So Yule might fall on the 20th of December one year and then the 22nd on another. And this all depends on the way we interact with the sun um, and how the sun will fall. So thankfully, um, a good almanac on the Internet will give you the dates that you need. And that's that's the best thing you can you can do to find out. That's if you want to work perfectly 
You might not. You might just think, well, look, you know, hey, it's easier for me to stick with the 21st of December is Yule. I'm going to stick with that date and do everything on that date. And the 21st of uh, June is the summer solstice and I'm going to stick with that date as well. Now, with all the harvest safely gathered in at Samhain, the new season or year began on November the 1st. Our ancient ancestors celebrations probably took place um, if they had a good harvest and then it was time to wait out the winter for another three months. In the Wiccan tradition there are lunar sabbats which many follow and they celebrate the new and full moon. They fall at the cross quarters because the solstices and equinoxes already work with the sun and the moon. So lunar celebrations suit those who like a quiet time or maybe a much gentler celebration. Now I've always seen the quarters and cross quarters and as full on energy of the sun, whereas the lunar celebrations are a much gentle time and these work very well with feminine energies. The easiest way of explaining the lunar festivals is to find the closest new moon to the darker times of the year. So Samhain, Yule, Limolk and the closest full moon to the lightest time, which would be Beltane to Lunasa. So. If you wish, you can use both, obviously, full and new moons. They've both got different energies to work with. Rather than me give you a list of dates that will be different next year, my suggestion is to look online for the dates and times the new and full moons appear in your time zone. Write them down in your journal so that you can plan ahead for any magical workings you wish to do or any meditations or charging of crystals, charging of water. Just because these may sound as though they are more attuned to Wiccan and witchcraft, it doesn't mean on your path you can't use them. You use what works for you. Um, I know I talk about the two together because Wiccan, witchcraft and Druidism all tend to, they do work the same, but different. <laughs> and I am going to do a podcast later in the year on the differences and... Um, although not, you know, they're, they're not huge, but there are some. Um, so, but for now, you <laughs> you just have to, just have to muddle through a little bit better. Um, so, with all this in mind, this year, this year is the Wheel of the Years anniversary. Um, it was first published in 1974, and it's therefore 50 years old. I wonder if Gardner, Nichols, Murray, Graves and Valiente had any inclination at all how far and wide their revival would have stretched across the world and also how much it's changed. Um, you know, what Gardner wanted to achieve from his uh, meetings, which were often sky clad, and the different types of meetings that Ross Nichols had with the Druids. So, how do we work with a wheel? If you look at the wheel, you'll see each festival as a marker point and every six weeks you can celebrate another turn and it gives us something to look forward to and to connect with. Each quarter of the wheel has its own attributions and a list of gods and goddesses from different cultures. Uh, for the purpose of this podcast, I'm going to stick to a fairly short list for each quarter of gods and goddesses that fall into the time frame. Uh, again, keeping it simple. Uh, so the goddess is associated with the quarter dates of spring would be Persephone, Greek, Ostara, Anglo-Saxon, Freya, Norse, Bloodworth, uh, Welsh Celtic, Flora, Roman, Rempet, Egyptian, Astarte is a Greek fertility goddess and Aphrodite, obviously the goddess of love. So the summer goddesses would be Irish Celtic, would be Anya and um, Maccab. Now, depending on the province, because traditionally they were both celebrated. And also you've got Lou at the end of summer in Irish Celtic. Roman goddess would be Sulis. Egyptian would be Sekhmet. Um, Belenos would be Beltane. Um, Greek uh, Dionysus, Irish Celtic again, the Dagda, and obviously, for everyone, the Green Man. <laughs> You've got also Isis and Gaia or um, as Mother Earth goddesses. Autumn gets a little bit smaller. Um, you 
got Pomona, who's the Roman goddess of apples, Hecate, which is the crone and dark mother as we go into the dark time of the year, the Kaliach, um, Keridwen, very important, and Keris, who was the Roman goddess of harvest. And winter, Bera, who was also, <coughs> oh, excuse me, known as the, the, as known as the Kaliach, and Bridget, who is the Kaliach as well. <laughs> I just get a bit confusing, those two. And um, Ariane Rod um, was a Welsh goddess of reincarnation and rebirth. Now, there are probably plenty more, and some of the names I've given could easily cross over into another season. Uh, none of them are fixed, really, um, except really, I suppose, Brigid is, um, as we've discussed before, and, and the Kaliak. Uh, these few are just a guide to start you on your path with working with goddesses and God's energy and basically do your own research. It was once said that you should stick to a pantheon, uh, meaning either stick to an Irish Celtic, stick to Welsh Celtic, to Greek, Norse, Egyptian, and don't confuse them, don't work with that energy from that one there, and don't bring in a Greek one if you're working with um, somebody from the Welsh Celtic energies. But, you know, we've moved on from the old dogma of do, as, uh, do it this way or it won't work at all. Um, just find a goddess that you want to work with, and if she isn't right for you, then just thank her. And work with another. Now, you may find you come back to the former gods and goddesses in the future after connecting with another. I've covered each festival date on my channel already. So whatever you're listening into, go back and scroll through and you'll see the different festival dates um, are in there. But <laughs> if all this has been lovely to listen to, but boy, that's far too much hard work and... You just want a simple and easy life for each festival. Then just light a candle and spend some time in the meditation or just sit and connect to the goddess Gaia, Mother Earth, and ask her to send you a guide who you could work with on your path at this time. Over the years, I've worked with all different spiritual guides who have popped in for a period of time, worked with me for something that I'm working on, um, and then gone away to work with somebody else. So... If you want to do more, there are plenty of ways as a solitary practitioner or even if there is a group of you, if you have a grove or a coven. And as long as the things are undertaken positively and for the greater good of the land and the persons involved, um, then have a listen to some of my previous podcasts on each of the festival dates and see if there is something there that you yeah, fancy having a go at. Um, when you do start to research on your path, I always say be diligent and careful on the internet. There are many websites out there that are just copy and pasted or they've picked up an RSS feed and um, from someone else. And someone could have spent hours writing and not such researching. It could even be someone who is a professor in um, a certain area. They've written something on the internet and it has been copied and AI is probably the worst for this. I have a slight problem with AI because I think it, it's going to cause some trouble for those of us who are busy writing away like we are now. And it, you could end up listening to somebody else's podcast um, that has been written and plagiarised, um, which I think is quite unfair. So if you're out looking for ways to romanticise the crafts, then that's okay for you. But if you're wanting to go deeper, then stick around with me. Um, obviously do your research yourself if you have time but if you don't listen in you know if I can help you find a way to discover your path and you might just take little tidbits here and there and go oh yeah that works for me and no I really don't like that idea then that's great because we all learn things in different ways I'm guided by spirit I'm guided by goddesses and also my DNA because I connect through my ancestors who went before me and I walk in, I suppose, <laughs> I walk in their, their their pathway and in their knowledge. And believe me, it can get quite noisy in my head sometimes when I'm writing because I have lots of them coming in going, oh, you don't forget to put this in. And it's going, OK, I'm not schizophrenic, honest. Um, I hope that this has been helpful in helping you to understand the wheel um, if you'd like to join me you can find me on facebook and instagram as alchemical serenity and also i've got a patreon page where you can buy me a cup of coffee or a cup of tea if you like to support my channel it's only once a month for is it three pound around five dollars i think 
Um, and also for all that you see, I'm a generous person. <laughs> I'll give you a shout out at the end of my podcasts. And also I do a weekly tarot card pull that I put into the members area and I I put a picture up of the card and it's meaning inside the members area. So you if you're a member, you can go in there and have a look at that and think, oh yeah, that you know, that's really worked with me this week. I am working on another tier on the Patreon account um, to bring you further magical workings. So you, there'll be things that you can download and print off. And uh, if you've got a magical journal or book of shadows or book of the ways, um, you'll be able to work deeper on your path. So shout outs. Um, I have two Patreons, which I'm like, yay. <laughs> Yeah, that's that's great. I think that's fantastic. Um, so to Kate and Karen, who are supporting me on Patreon, thank you, ladies. It really is nice to have you here. And we've had some, I've had some chats um, already in there about some of the things that we do, which is nice. If you're a Patreon, you can um, pop a question on there, and hopefully, I'll, you know, if I get a chance, I will. I'll reply to you um, on whether it's um, it could be on mostly on the tarot card readings. If you've got any questions about those. Um, if you've liked the podcast today, please give me a like or a five star review on wherever you are listening. And if you're on YouTube, then obviously it's free to subscribe there as well. And there's no spamming from me. Um, I always try and reply to everybody who comments as it's lovely to hear from you. And also what you do in your path. Um, we've had some conversations in the, especially about Brigid and the meditation. And that's been really interesting to find out where you are. So please feel free to say hello on any of the platforms. I, I mean, YouTube is probably the one that I um, talk about the most. Um, I'm on there quite often, so come and join me on YouTube. It'd be really nice to um, build that one, um, you know, and get quite a few subscribers on there so that we keep uh, sending this this information out to as many people as possible. So thank you once again, and see you next time on the Alchemical Serenity Pagan Podcast. Love, light and peace to you wherever you are in the world on your path and I'll see you again soon. Bye for now.